First, they wanted to be our friend. Then they wanted to be our boss. Now they want to be our master. Soon, they'll want to be our god. We're living right in the middle of the greatest power grab in history. Alexander the Great, Julius Caesar, Napoleon Bonaparte, they had dreams of conquering the world. Who would have thought that the goal would only be reached by the likes of Mark Zuckerberg, Jack Dorsey, and Susan Wojcicki? How did a handful of tech CEOs succeed where the greatest conquerors of all time failed? Since all of the major platforms use the exact same method to build their global tech empires, and since their power to control you and everyone around you is growing exponentially, this might be a good time to learn and understand their tactics, which will put you in a better position to resist and expose them. Big Tech presents How to Conquer the World in Three Simple Steps. First, monopolize some form of social media. Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube are monopolies, but they monopolize different types of social media. Facebook is a social network. Twitter is a microblogging platform. YouTube is a video sharing platform. If you develop some new type of social media, or if you come up with a way for your platform to be favored over other platforms, or if you have endless trunks of money behind you, you can drive out competition and monopolize a form of speech on a global scale. For instance, YouTube was purchased by Google in 2006. Since Google has a monopoly on internet searches, it was able to favor YouTube in searches, thus constantly driving people to its video platform and away from other video platforms. Since Google also runs Google AdSense, Google was able to run ads on YouTube, thus generating billions of dollars in revenue, but also allowing the platform to pay content creators. When video creators realized that they could make a living on YouTube, but not on other platforms, they abandoned the other platforms and started posting on YouTube. So thanks to Google's monopoly, YouTube attracted all of the best content creators and other platforms were left with few creators, no money, and no way of being found in internet searches. That's how you monopolize a form of social media. Second, make it impossible, or at least extremely difficult, to leave the platform. Social media is the cocaine of the compliant. The little jolts of dopamine you get from posting on Twitter and Facebook and checking your likes and shares are very similar to the jolts of dopamine you get from using drugs. This is why the platforms are addictive. The problem is compounded by the monopoly status of the platforms. Your friends and your family and all of the people you like to interact with are all on Facebook. If you leave Facebook, you lose that interaction. Telling someone to leave Facebook is like telling him to leave his home and his family and go live in the Arizona desert. It can be done, but the desert is a sad, lonely place. So people stay on Facebook even when they find out what it's doing with their data. YouTube is a little different, whereas Facebook and Twitter, with their interactions and reactions, are like a drug, YouTube just wants you to keep watching videos. The YouTube algorithm is designed with a single key purpose. Keep you on YouTube for as long as possible every single day. The algorithm keeps a record of your watch history and it learns which kind of content you love to watch. It then offers you an endless supply of that content. You watch a video and YouTube recommends several more. You pick one and watch it and YouTube offers you several more. And the more the algorithm learns, the more it learns how to please you. Ladies and gentlemen, imagine meeting a man or a woman who was designed and programmed to give you everything you want every moment of every day. How would you ever walk away? Where else could you go from there? That's what the algorithm is designed to be, your perfect pleasure-generating dream companion. 
Leaving a major social media platform that you've spent a significant amount of time on is equivalent to checking into a rehab center. The platforms are designed to be like the Hotel California. You can check out anytime you like, but you can never leave. Third, once you've established a monopoly, and once people are addicted to your platform, control their speech so that you can eventually control their thinking. Now, the platforms do this in a variety of ways. They promote content that espouses the right political and religious ideas. They suppress content that espouses the wrong political and religious ideas. They monetize users and channels with the right ideas. They demonetize users and channels with the wrong ideas. We're all familiar with that sort of thing. But let's talk about how these platforms have weaponized their policies. There are two relevant tactics here. I call them selective rule enforcement and artificial rule enforcement. Selective rule enforcement is enforcing a policy against people who have the wrong ideas, but not enforcing it against people who have the right ideas. So, a platform makes a policy against threats of violence. When someone with the wrong political or religious ideas threatens someone, he gets banned. But when someone with the right political or religious ideas threatens someone, the platform lets him slide. This can actually be done on a much larger scale. Why did Amazon shut down Parler? Because there were threats of violence on the platform. But there are far, far more threats of violence on Twitter, so why doesn't Amazon shut down Twitter? Selective rule enforcement. Artificial rule enforcement is enforcing a policy against people who haven't actually violated the policy in order to justify punishing them for some other reason, namely for having the wrong political or religious views. Sometimes you're not allowed to say why you're really banning someone. So you have to claim that you're banning them for violating some policy, even if they haven't actually violated the policy. Let me give you an example that doesn't involve social media. Suppose a white racist owns a restaurant, and he doesn't want any non-white people at his restaurant. He can't just put up a sign that says whites only because it's illegal to ban people because of their race. So he gets creative. He puts up a no nudity sign. That's the policy, no nudity. But then, when a Chinese couple shows up for dinner, he says to them, oh, I'm sorry, you can't come in here. We have a no nudity policy. The Chinese couple replies, what are you talking about? We're not nude. And the owner says, yeah, but we're the sole judges of whether a person is nude or not. And we've decided that you're nude. And it doesn't matter if you disagree with us. It doesn't matter if every sane person in the world disagrees with us. Because, again, we're the sole judges. So, this man gets to have a whites-only restaurant by artificially enforcing a policy. How does this work on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube? Well, these platforms don't want to say that they're banning content for political or religious reasons because there might be tons of people who share those same views and the platforms don't want to cause an exodus from the platform. They want to manipulate and control people on the platform. So they make rules like no calls for violence, no hate speech, and so on but then they enforce those rules against users who obviously haven't violated the policies in any way. Let's say you have the wrong political or religious views, and you happen to be someone that Twitter does want to get rid of. But you haven't violated any of Twitter's policies, so there's no clear justification for banning you. One day you tweet, I'm not going to the Super Bowl. And the Twitter trust and safety team says, what? You say you're not going to the Super Bowl? That's basically inviting terrorists to attack the Super Bowl. That's a call for violence. You're banned. All of the platforms have shown over and over again that they're willing to interpret people's words to mean anything they want in order to justify banning certain content 
or users. Let's say you make a YouTube video condemning honor killings or discussing the persecution of religious minorities. Suddenly, your video is banned and you're suspended. The YouTube trust and safety team sends you a message saying, that's hate speech. We don't allow hate speech. If you were to ask them about it, they would say, I'm sorry, but we're the sole judges of whether a person has posted hate speech. And we've decided that you've posted hate speech. And it doesn't matter if you agree with us. It doesn't matter if every sane person in the world disagrees with us. Because, again, we're the sole judges. Artificial rule enforcement. All they need to do is continue selectively enforcing rules and artificially enforcing rules, and they can eliminate all of the wrong political and religious views from their platforms without people realizing it and without causing the dreaded exodus. Putting all of this together, when the platforms needed users and content creators, they announced to the world that everyone is welcome. Tell your friends, tell your family that these platforms are the place to be. Once they had monopolized some form of speech, the message suddenly shifted to, actually, only certain ideas are welcome here. Only certain ideas will be praised and promoted here. Other ideas are condemned and banned. But we know that you'll adapt to the new rules because you're addicted to our platform and because there's no place else to go. The result of these tactics is that the platforms create a constant, relentless pressure, pushing the population in the direction they want it to go. And the direction they want it to go is them having totalitarian control over everything you say, knowing that if they control what people say, they can ultimately control what people think. And that's how big tech became big brother. What can we do now? There's plenty we can do, and I'll discuss some things we can do in future videos, but I'll mention two simple steps. One, support small tech. If you learned anything from the parlor shutdown, it's that big tech fears small tech because they want to keep their monopolies. So check out Mines, Rumble, BitChute, MeWe, Gab, and hopefully Parler. The links to my pages on all of those platforms are in the description box. Second, use big tech to expose big tech. The best place to expose what Facebook is doing is on Facebook. The best place to expose what Twitter is doing is on Twitter. The best place to expose what YouTube is doing is on YouTube. As an ancient rule, if an army is too big and too powerful to be defeated directly, use guerrilla tactics. In this case, you would use virtual guerrilla tactics, exposing big tech wherever possible, hit and run style. You can start by sharing this video everywhere there's a place to share it.